So I'm Ginger Yoder, your director of family ministries. And once again, I get to be here with you today as we journey. Reverend Elizabeth is taking a couple weeks of vacation, which is well deserved and well needed as she travels back from the East Coast. And I'm so happy that I get to be here with you. And before we begin, we have a brief and exciting announcement from the building committee. We have contractor bids in hand. Four contractors submitted bids for the building addition and church remodel project. The identity of the contractors and the amounts of the bids are confidential for now. Not surprisingly, all four bids were higher than the original estimated project costs. However, the project committee leadership agrees the project is achievable. Yay, we're very excited and moving forward optimistically. The next steps. Al Poplowski, chair of the Capital Campaign Building Committee, is working with our architect and the contractors to resolve questions about some details and reviewing suggestions about how we might save money on the project. The UUCP Finance Committee has been working with our local bank to secure a construction loan. We do not want the congregation to be burdened with a mortgage. So we anticipate additional fundraising will be needed to completely pay for the project. You will be hearing more about that very soon. Finally, there will be a meeting of the Moscow City Planning and Zoning Committee to consider the UUCP applications for a conditional use permit and a variance for the project. If you can possibly attend, it might make a difference. No speaking required, just the power of your presence. The meeting is Tuesday, September 29th at 7 p.m. at Moscow City Hall. Seating is limited, so please come early and be willing to stand outside if necessary. Thank you. Yay, we're moving forward. Unfortunately, it looks like that meeting already passed and I'm excited to hear what happened because I don't actually know and I bet we'll have an update at some point soon. And it is exciting times and it's good to be here even virtually. And we have another exciting special announcement and invitation for everyone this beautiful morning. I can't believe this weather, it's beautiful. And our service today centers on the ideas of finding balance and peace and comfort in nature. And what better way to engage in these themes than to engage in them in real life. So we're gonna try something new we're going to gather together in person with safety measures in place. So here are the invitation and details. Following the service this morning, you're invited to gather at Idler's Rest Nature Preserve north of Moscow with other UUCPers. And if you haven't been there, it's a beautiful park that features um, a cedar grove and a few miles of hiking trails. And we'll be describing some specific practices to engage in later in the service, um, including creating nature altars and mandalas out of found objects. Um, and you're invited to do that or just walk or commune in nature. And if you can't come, we have alternative ideas in mind as well. And if you, if you decide to come, we ask that we keep social distance of at least six feet between households and that we, of course, are meeting outside only, which is safer, and that everyone wear masks. And that way, um, we're engaging in safely. And we're also doing this over a period of time, from about 12 noon to about 3 p.m. And any time you can come between those hours, that would spread us out, be less um, impactful on the small parking area there and um, give us all a chance to commune safely. So think about if you'd like to come and do that. 
there is a sign up genius online if you want to sign up for a specific time or just come when you can. Um, I'm very excited that I might get to see some of you outside of my computer screen because it's been a really long time and I really, really miss you. Now let's settle down and begin. Please say with me our words of welcome. Whoever you are, wherever you've come from, whatever your beliefs, whomever you love, and however bumpy your life's journey, know that you are welcome here. We're hoping that everyone has a chalice or a candle to light and something to light it with. Let's light our chalices together. Hello, I'm Ginger Yoder and I am going to light our chalice this morning. In the light of truth and the warmth of love, we gather to seek and seek to share. much fun doing that chalice lighting because I got to be in the real church and I just recorded it on my cell phone and uploaded it to Paul and myself on Google Drive and we actually have it set up that anyone could go in and do a chalice lighting and we only have one other one you haven't seen yet so maybe you will consider going into church during summer at Stephen's office hours which are listed online and recording your own chalice lighting for all of us to see, because that would be really cool. I'd like to see you there. Plus the chance to be in the church was a really moving experience for me. And as I'd like, as I share some opening words, I invite everyone who has access to the chat to check in by typing your name. And if you're a virtual visitor, also share in the chat where you're logging in from. We hold hope close by Reverend Teresa Ines Soto. In this community, we hold hope close. We don't always know what comes next, but we cannot, that cannot dissuade us. We always, we don't always know just what to do, but that will not mean that we are lost in the wilderness. We rely on the certainty beneath the foundations of our values and ethics we are the people who return to love like a North Star and to truth that we are greater together than we are alone. Our hope does not live in some glimmer of an indistinct future. Rather, we know the way to the world of which we dream and by covenant and the movement forward of one right action and then the next. We know that one day we will arrive at home. We'll now have the opening hymn, Morning Has Come.
Right now, I'm feeling as though each new day brings a challenge, more to take in, and my precious balance being tested by shifting loads and weight. And I see this in those I love as well, with my friends, my family, and my child. It might be the news that sets my head spinning, or it might be a household emergency like the new water heater we needed this week. Or it might just be a simply a hard day at distance learning. More so than ever, I'm feeling as though I need to engage in restorative practices that help me regain my footing and my strength. And this morning, I want to walk with you through a restorative spiritual practice that I have and that I've shared with the children in RE and my own child, but I realized I haven't really shared with the adults, so I hope you can listen in as well. So I love to create nature-based mandalas and altars with found objects from my walks and my bike rides. Now a mandala begins with a simple act of arranging items in a circular pattern, but its meaning is far from basic. According to the mandalaproject.com, a mandala represents wholeness and can be seen as a model for the organizational structure of life itself a cosmic diagram that reminds us of our relation to the infinite, the world that extends both beyond and within our bodies and mind. Mandalas occur across many spiritual practices and religions and across the history of mankind. Now, you might not agree that a mandala is uh, a cosmic design, but it's hard, to, it's hard to say that it's not satisfying in its beauty in its simplicity, and that it's what it speaks to our hearts and souls. And sometimes a mandala is beyond my reach and I create nature altars. And that's simply in arranging items in a way that pleases me, on a log, on a stump, on the ground. And natural altars can look any way you wish. Now, this type of spiritual practice can be done anytime. I'm out in nature, whether I'm in my own backyard or on top of a mountain. And really at its heart, it's about slowing down. It's about noticing. It's about listening to the voices in the natural world and the small, quiet voice inside each of us. Now I'm gonna show you a bit more in a slideshow I've created. And it takes me just a second always to get there. It's gonna, I know Paul is much better at getting this started. There we go. So Heidi Dar Hope is a blogger and in her blog, Mindful Nature Mandalas, a restorative practice on the website healingicons.org explains her process of creating nat nature mandalas. And it really resonated with me, so I wanted to share it with you. Consider if you took a slow, mindful walk. What if you slowed down to pay attention to the color and the sounds, the shapes and the patterns, the leaves and feathers, the rocks, butterflies and bugs? You get the idea. What if you picked up a couple things that appealed to you while you were walking? What if at the end of your walk, you place those things in a bowl or in a plate? I collected these just recently on a walk that I took. And they, they actually just spoke to me just the way they were. I loved them. And she continues, what if you pondered and reflected upon what was in your collection bowl? All of these treasures hold up a different energy, a different meaning. A feather conjures up something far different from a rock. An autumn leaf is far different than a spring leaf. Be playful in your associations. After you let the elements in your collection bowl have a conversation with each other and with you, 
Think about creating a mandala, or I would add an altar. There is no right or wrong way to do this. Just follow the lead from what you have gathered. Feel free to add things as you get into the flow of mandala making. Here are some examples of mandalas I have made, or I have been in present for, or I found online. This one was an example online I particularly loved. Each is unique to the time, place, and person who created it. Each has a sense of the person's spirit and the spirit of the natural place where it was created. This one was created by Avi Gibbler in our congregation. I'll show you a few more from Lex Stewart. Love the rainbow leaves. Another one I found online. I created this one when I felt the world needed a little bit more love. My son John created this at Idler's Rest. And another one I found online. Each of these is also temporary. It's not per a permanent fixture, but represents a moment in time. Dar Hope continues in her blog. Lastly, you may want to wonder if there's any relationship and meaning in your own life. And for clarity, I'll add between the mandala that you've created in your life. For example, a person struggling might want to choose a place of soft leaves within the mandala to represent the tenderness and vulnerability of life. Another might pick up an acorn and realize they've been neglecting their own life's potential. A question to ask is, how does the mandala represent you? And I, I think also, how does the mandala represent your connection? with the universe, with our natural world. So today after service, during your visit to Idler's Rest, I invite you to create a natural altar or mandala. And if you can't make this journey with us after church, I invite you to make one at home, in objects in your backyard, or even things that you have around the house already. There are also countless mandalas online to give you inspiration or coloring pages that you can print out and color. And if you'd like to share, please take a picture of your creation and send it to me or to the church office. And I'd like to put them all together so we can have a sense of our shared and unique selves. Thanks so much. And I hope that this speaks to you as much as it does to me.
A biography of Wendell Berry, excerpted from the Poetry Foundation. Poet, novelist, and environmentalist Wendell Berry lives in Port Royal, Kentucky, near his birthplace, where he has maintained a farm for over 40 years. Mistrustful of technology, he holds deep reverence for the land and is a staunch defender of agrarian values. He is the author of over 50 books of poetry, fiction, and essays. His poetry celebrates the holiness of, of life and everyday miracles that often taken for granted. Critics and scholars have acknowledged Wendell Berry as a master of many literary genres, but whether he is writing poetry, fiction, or essays, his message is essentially the same. Humans must learn to live in harmony with the natural rhythms of the earth or perish. Berry believes that traditional values such as marital fidelity and strong community ties are essential for the survival of humankind. In his view, the disintegration of communities can be traced to the rise of agribusiness, large-scale farming under the control of giant corporations. Besides relying on chemical pesticides and fertilizer, fertilizers, promoting soil erosion and causing depletion of ancient aquifers, agribusiness has driven countless farmers countless small farms out of existence and destroyed local communities in the process. In an interview, Barry said, we must support what supports local life, which means community, family, household life. The moral capital of our larger institutions have come to rest upon. If the larger institutions undermine the local life, they destroy that moral capital just exactly as the industrial economy has destroyed the natural capital of localities, soil fertility, and so on. Essential wisdom accumulates in community, much as fertility builds in the soil. Barry's themes are reflected in his life. As a young man, he spent time in California and Europe and New York City. Eventually, however, he returned to the Kentucky land that had been settled by his forebears in the early 19th century. He taught for many years at the University of Kentucky, but eventually resigned in favor of full-time farming. He uses horses to work his land and employs organic methods of fertilization and pest control. It was as a poet that Barry first gained literary recognition. While reviewing his collected poems, 1957 to 1982, New York Times Book Review contributor David Ray called Barry's style resonant and authentic and claimed that the poet can be said to have returned American poetry to a Wordsworthian clarity of purpose. There are times when we might think he is returning us to the simplicities of John Clare or the crustiness of Robert Frost, but as with every major poet, passages in which style threatens to become a voice of its own suddenly give way, like the sound of chopping in a murmurous forests, to lines of power and then memorable resonance. The practice of lexino, lex, lexico divinia, I have an issue with words sometimes, involves reading and rereading a text, meditating on it, entering into conversation with it and with the creative spirit. By letting the words flow over us multiple times, we can begin to understand not only the text in new ways, but how it speaks to our hearts and minds how it calls to us. So today we're gonna to take the poem, Peace of the Wild Things by Wendell Berry, who you've now heard a little bit more about as our text. We've actually already heard this poem in our musical piece. Did you catch that? Which was so lovely. And Nancy gave us um, a short biography and now she'll give us Berry's own thoughts on the poem and his work giving us an initial context to which to hear the words. We will then hear the poem three times again, read in turn by different congregants and our own Elizabeth Stevens. And there will be reflection questions in between that I invite you to open your heart to. Again, here's Nancy. In 1991, Wendell Berry wrote for the Atlantic Magazine on loving the place where you are. Barry said, if we want to put local life in proper relation to the globe, we must do so by imagination, 
charity, and forbearance, and by making local life as independent and self-sufficient as we can, not by the presumptuous abstractions of global thought. If we want to keep our thoughts and our acts from destroying the globe, then we must see to it that we do not ask too much of the globe or of any part of it. To make sure that we do not ask too much, we must learn to live at home as independently and self-sufficiently as we can. That is the only way we can keep the land we are using and its ecological limits always in sight. In order to make ecological good sense for the planet, you must make ecological good sense locally. You can't act locally by thinking globally. If you want to keep your local acts from destroying the globe, you must think locally. The question before us then is an extremely difficult one. How do we begin to remake or make a local culture that will preserve our part of the world while we use it? We are talking here not just about a kind of knowledge that involves affection, but also a kind of knowledge that comes from or with affection. Knowledge that is unavailable to the unfectionate and that is unavailable to anyone that, as what is also called information. The real work of planet saving will be small, humble, and humbling. And in so far as it involves love, pleasing, and rewarding, its jobs will be too many to count, too many to report, too many to be publicly noticed or rewarded, too small to make anyone rich or famous. What might be the economic result of local affection? We don't know. Moreover, we are probably never going to know in any way that would satisfy the average dean or corporate executive. The ways of love tend to be secretive and even to the lovers themselves, somewhat inscrutable. So take a moment, find your feet on the floor, Feel your back against your chair or the couch. Feel your breath. As you listen this first time to Fran Rodriguez read our poem, ask yourself, what does this stir in you? What emotions or feelings or thoughts just bubble up and come to the surface? Piece of Wild Things by Wendell Berry. When despair for the world grows in me and I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go down and lie where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world and am free. We will hear again the poem, this time read by Pat First. And I wonder, what line or what stanza stands out to you the most? What are the words that resonate with your spirit? The Peace of Wild Things by Wendell Berry. When despair for the world grows in me, and I wake in the night at the least sound, in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be. I go and lie down where the wood drake rests, in his beauty on the water, and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things, who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief, I come into the presence of still water, and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world and am free.
And as we listen for a third and final time, I wonder what response does this poem call forth within you? This could be a call for action or a call for stillness, a call for movement or a call for rest. It could be a calling that comes from within you or maybe a calling that comes from a greater force outside of yourself. I invite you to listen for what comes through this last time. When despair for the world grows in me and I wake in the night at the least sound, in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be. I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water, and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water, and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world and am free. We'll now have him for the beauty of the earth. Elizabeth Stevens is driving back across the country, but she took a moment to record her own reflection on Peace of the Wild Things, and we want to give that to you now. Hello, beloveds. As you hear these words from me, I'm actually on vacation uh, somewhere between Massachusetts and home probably out on a hike, certainly seeking the peace of wild things, which for me is less about still water and more about high places. But in any event, I am taking some vacation and while that might feel a little self-indulgent, um, I know enough about how human beings work that I, I recognize it's actually the most important thing that I could be doing. See when we there there's a zone of it's called the zone of productive stress when we are below a threshold of productive stress we aren't we we drift into entropy so we're not healthy when we're above the zone of productive stress uh, we become activated anxious agitated 
Um, and in that place, um, I, I'll just speak for myself, I'm not effective. I'm not effective in my work. I'm not effective in my home life. I'm not a lot of fun to be around. And I can say that really for the last several years, I'm spending an awful lot of time closer to that upper level, <laughs> that, that upper line than I would like to admit. And I've gotten clearer and clearer that the single most important thing that we can do are the practices that bring us down back into that productive zone. Because when we're in the productive zone, we make a big difference in the world. When we're in the productive zone, we're able to grow and change and evolve. So whether you go out and seek the peace of wild things and making mandalas, or whether for you it's a piece of knitting or a piece of binge watching or the piece of staring into space and doing nothing or the piece of um, uh, you know, quilting or doing yard work, whatever it is that helps lower your stress level so that you can come back into that productive zone. Uh, I urge you to, to do it and embrace it. And don't feel guilty. It's not self-indulgent. It actually is an act of resistance. I love you all. I miss you. I'll see you soon. And now our closing reading by Sean Parker Dennison. At this moment of ending, may there be a good word, a blessing, to help us remember what we have so often forgotten. May the message we need be gently spoken and held in the spaces of ourselves and the fibers that hold all we need to maintain our gentleness, our courage, and our hope. At this moment of ending, may the goodness we wish for ourselves and each other, this community, this ecosystem, this planet and stardust galaxy becomes such a part of us that we cannot tell where the blessing ends and we begin. you to extinguish your flame with these words. We extinguish this chalice that it might glow gently in our hearts. May it light our paths as we leave this place. May it guide our way until we are together again. I hope to see you soon.